Fisch. Well, good morning, everybody. I'll get your attention. We were just watching some VBS slides. I think VBS went well. And uh, hey, go ahead and stand back up. I know you just sat down. Let's stand back up. And we'll get started here this morning. Oh, 
feeling good? All right. Hey, we got a new song here, so let's see how you guys do on this one. No pressure. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. 
Turn around, say hello this morning. Tell me you're glad to see you here. All right. Hey, good crowd, everybody. It's good to see you all here this morning. Good to hear you. Good clapping. Were you clapping, Gary? No? <laughs> hey, I, I, I know we don't bring birthdays up, but I guess there's a couple young birthdays today. Do we, do we know who they are? Can we give a whoop, whoop? Where are they at? Raise your hand. Raise it high. Happy birthday. There you go. Give them a round. Whoop. Yeah. Anybody else got a birthday today? Anybody else want to admit they got a birthday today? All right. Hey, the rain's coming down. Uh, how many got wet coming in? Yep, there you are. Okay. So if anybody starts stinking at the end, it's your fault, right?
It's now time uh, for us to um, celebrate and remember the lyrics of the first line of the hymn we just sang, You gave, you gave your life away for me. So for communion medication this morning, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have not prophetic powers, and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind, Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Might ask yourself why this section of scripture for today's communion meditation. Partly um, influenced by the fact that some of you may know that Susan and I celebrated with our children and our grandchildren in a remote location uh, this past week, our 50th wedding anniversary celebration. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Uh, I'm going to cry up here if we're not careful here, okay? <laughs> and I, I would say to you that it was a family gathering in a remote location, kind of south in southwestern Pennsylvania, north of Maryland and, and West Virginia. Some of you love that country, if you will. But we experienced all four forms of Greek love mentioned in the New Testament in that gathering. So I'm not going to test you. The first one is eros, if you will, romantic love, which is how this whole thing all got started in the first place. Storge speaks of family love as in the love of a parent for a child. 
And so there was plenty of storge love there, which we are exceedingly grateful for. Phileo describes brotherly love or friendship love, which hopefully the generations behind us show to the, each other and to others in their life. And then finally, agape love describes the highest form of love, a love that sacrifices itself for the one loved. Best exemplified by John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only one, his, his one and only son. So sacrifice of Christ was the ultimate in agape love. And it's hard for me anyway to aspire to that. Um, uh, it's hard for me to appreciate how much was given to us through all of that. And a couple of things happened. So uh, this, this, that influenced me for this meditation. And I, I'd say, it, how do we even comprehend, appreciate, and appropriate God's agape love for us through Christ sacrificing himself for us? So if you say that 50 years of marriage you daily apply verses 4 through 7, it's an impossible task save God's forgiveness through Christ's death on a cross. That's 18,250 days plus an extra 12 and a half days for the leap years that, of, of wedded bliss, of course, that Christ has given his agape love to Susan and I. However, our impossible challenge is to love each other in a way uh, that is patient and kind, does not envy or boast, is not arrogant or rude, does not insist on its own way, is not irritable or resentful, does not rejoice in wrongdoing, rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endure all things. Please join us in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace that has been given to us, for the sacrifice that has been given to us. Help each here to sincerely appreciate the love that you've shown for us and help each of us to do our best, even though it's humanly impossible to understand that and share that, but most importantly, help us to be thankful for your sacrifice on our behalf. In Christ's name, amen.
at this time, all the young people can be um, go with Miss Tracy, with her to the other building. You're excused. Now, I suppose any adults that want to go and see what goes on, you're excused too. We want to just, Tracy, as you're on your way out, we'd like to congratulate you on a successful vacation Bible school this week. Yep, thank you. Our church supports a lot of missions. Uh, we have throughout the years. We've been a very good uh, supporter of missions. And currently we have 11 different missions that we support that we give something monthly to those particular missions. And the one I'm going to talk about today is the Bejo Christian Mission in San Pedro Sula, Honduras. And we give to that mission $310. We're obligated to give them $310 a month. And the people that work there are uh, Mark and Joy Hoff, who have been at, uh, at the Beiju Christian Mission, or BCM, since 2001. They joined Mark's parents, who started at uh, the BCM in 1993. So we've been supporting them for quite a while. And Mark and Joy have been here before. They, whenever they're home on furlough, they always come to our church and, uh, on a Sunday morning and, and share with us what's going on. So they've been very good about keeping up with what's going on. BCM's primary focus is to train Honduras men who desire to be ministers at local Honduras churches. They work not only with the, the men, but also their wives. After the men become ministers, they continue to assist them through retreats, visits to their local churches. Joy is primarily works with the minister's wives to give them assistance and encouragement. Uh, Mark and Joy also encourage new and existing missionaries who come to Honduras. The transition can be challenging and discouraging at times. They help lead an arm, a, um, annual missionary conference for missionary families. They also work at training and educating church leaders in the local churches who have desires to be Sunday school teachers, worship leaders, and elders. Their plate is full, and they are continuing to do the work, and we continue to assist them. We thank everybody for the support that they give to missions. In case you're a stranger or not familiar with our church, you can give to the missionary offerings or to, for the missions at any point in time when you give your offerings. You can, um, if you have a give by check and you want to give so much to missions, you can designate this amount, please put towards missions. If you give cash, uh, put it something in, an, if you want to give to missions once in a while, put something in an envelope and mark the missions so they know that that's going directly to the missions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Bejo Christian Mission that we support in Honduras. We know that times there sometimes, Father, can be tough, as they are in many countries. But Lord, your gospel is still spread no matter how tough the conditions are. People learn about Jesus Christ no matter what, how much hatred and, and strife is going on in particular countries. No matter where they are around the world, there's Christians everywhere. And we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for the Bible and pray that it will continue to be used and spread in Honduras, not only there, but in our country. And that, Father, we might live up to your standards of what you want and demand from us. Thank you again. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jack. Good morning. I want to say welcome if you're visiting. Thanks for visiting. It's good to see you. Stick around. Let us get to know you a little bit. A um, couple things. There are bulletins on the um, chairs beside you. Take a look at them. There is a very long prayer list. There are Many, many of your brothers and sisters that uh, have lost loved ones, that are dealing with health issues, have family members dealing with health issues, they need your prayers. Um, a special prayer for Dave Smith's mom this morning. He's with her in, uh, in the hospital. She needs your prayers. Um, Tracy said, I don't know if you heard her on the way out, thank you to the VBS helpers and the workers that were here. 
Uh, it was awesome. If you haven't seen a VBS and seen 60 or 70 kids in a pile on the floor in here screaming and yelling, uh, it's exciting. It makes you love God. Um, Mr. Terry is not here this morning. We have a special guest. He doesn't need introduction, but it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Dan Hamilton uh, to bring a message from God this morning. If you'll pray with me. Father God in heaven, thank you for another day you've given us to worship you, to praise you, to study your word and fellowship with brothers and sisters here. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth. Open our hearts and minds to Dan's sermon. Guide him and his thoughts and his words. Lead us to you. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's just really good to see all of you. Good to be back. You come here and uh, it just seems like we're coming home always to Croton. Appreciate that. We love you guys in the Lord. We pray for you. Appreciate everything that you are, all that you do for Christ. And uh, again, God bless you all. In case you're relatively new here, in case you're online, maybe just uh, glancing in at the first time in our services, my name is Dan Hamilton. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, our family was blessed to be a part of this congregation for 36 years. And in two, uh, December of 2021, I retired from Croton. But here's what's happened in the past 18 or 19 months in our lives. For the first year, I did some fill-in preaching, and other congregations traveled around a little bit. COVID was kind of rampant, so we didn't do a lot of that. I uh, was hired part-time with uh, Timmy Debolt and crew at Ohio Foundation Seeds. Carmen, you have my blessings putting up with that guy. I don't know how you do it, but it's, it's amazing. Uh, just appreciate the work there and being able to work with uh, both Jack and Tim and some other guys there. Also, for a while, I worked hauling sawdust, which was really interesting. Uh, went to Amish horse farms, or Amish sawmills, rather, and then delivered the sawdust to horse farms all over the place. So that was kind of interesting. Did that for a little while. And then uh, at the beginning of this year, began preaching at the Eden Church of Christ. <clears throat> That's in St. Louisville, that area. Appreciate your prayers for that little congregation, a very loving group of people. Small congregation, but uh, appreciate your prayers as we continue to, uh, to work there. Karen retired from teaching at Northridge last September. We spent a good deal of time helping out with her folks. Uh, both of them were in uh, poor health as they aged, so we spent time there taking care of them. Finally got them into a nursing facility, uh, sold their condo, just a lot of stuff with that. Our son, his wife, and two grandchildren moved back from Denver, Colorado to our area. That made us really happy. I found out I had prostate cancer and made it through surgery. Again, appreciate your prayers with that. A little over two months ago, Karen lost her stepmother, and then uh, about two weeks ago, Karen's father died after hip surgery. So we're in the midst of mixed emotions there, trying to settle an estate and everything. Lots going on there. And then there's one other thing that happened. We acquired a cat. Karen was away taking care of grandchildren. I was home alone all by myself, and Huckleberry showed up, a cat. And uh, so I took a little video on the phone, sent it to Karen, and her reaction was, we don't need a cat. I don't want a cat. Don't you dare feed that cat. Get that cat out of here. Two days later after she came, it was, Mama's here now. It's okay, baby. And Huck has become a part of our family now. In all of that, in the last year and a half or so, the Lord has blessed and the Lord through his people have truly blessed us. Can we pray together before we look at God's word? Father, it's a joy to be in your house, to be with your people. It's a joy to realize that your son Jesus Christ gave his life away for us. We celebrate that and thank you for that. We're thankful that he's coming again. Father, would you help us daily as we strive to walk with you? We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. 
If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Genesis chapter 6? Genesis chapter 6. We're going to start in kind of with verse 5 and just read a portion of this chapter. Genesis chapter 6, beginning with verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air. For I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. And he walked with God. And he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people on the earth, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out." I'll stop there. The passage goes on to to talk about the details of the ark and and what would happen. As we talk about Noah today, there are a couple of temptations. Number one, we could kind of get lost in the details. How could this possibly happen? Were the animals full grown or were there babies? Were there some who hadn't hatched yet? How many rooms were in the ark? How did they clean out all the manure in the ark? Where did the family live? All these kinds of things you try and think about. There's that temptation of getting lost in the details. And then the other temptation, anytime you talk about Noah and the ark, you're tempted to think about sort of a Disney-like character, Noah. He almost, in our minds, sometimes represents uh, Papa Smurf. Little blue robe and a sash and the animals are all around him. You think of a guy who gave to every save the animal, whatever animal you want to put in there, that slot, foundation, because he loved animals, he's, he's surrounded with them. It's just a, a lovely fairy tale. Anytime I think about Noah's Ark, I think about the same lady you think about, if you've been here a long time, Gloria Hatton, who taught the one through four-year-olds for 40, 50-some years, had every imaginable Noah Ark, earring, Afghan, figurine, dolls, Fisher Price, everything. She had it and loved Noah and the ark. That's great. But I don't want us to think of him as some kind of a cartoon character. He's a real live person. Jesus spoke of him. Peter mentions him a, a couple of times in his letters. He's a real man. From China to the American Indians, even some of the Colombian, pre-Columbian Indians, there's a myth of a great flood. If the flood is God's plan for saving a, a tiny portion of humanity, then so this man Noah is a real man as well. Let's talk about him. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now get the context of, of where we began this morning. The earth is corrupt You can't believe how corrupt the earth is at this point. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. It's kind of tough to grasp how humans created in the image of God could distance themselves so far from God by their actions, by their attitudes. It's hard to even grasp today in our world, but it happens, doesn't it? We get so far away from the Lord. Noah, Scripture says, walked with God. The rest of this humankind at this point seems to be running away from God, running in the opposite direction. Now, Scripture says, Noah was a righteous man. And I've got to struggle with that just a little bit. Because Scripture also says that no one is righteous. Paul quotes Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 and Romans 5. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They've 
together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Newsflash, you and I, we're kind of rotten to the core when it comes to righteousness. We're not good enough, we're not smart enough, and we can't stand up to, to God's measuring stick for righteousness. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans says. It's, it's not Noah's actions, it's not his works or his thoughts that make him righteous in God's sight. Even after the flood, we see Noah's sinful nature. Noah's a farmer, he plants a vineyard, harvests some of the grapes, stomps them out in his bathtub, makes some wine, gets drunk, and he sins. And yet he's called a righteous man. It's his faith that counts for righteousness. He reminds me of Abram. Abram believed God. Scripture tells us Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. So Noah was blameless along the people of his time. In the midst of a, a totally evil congregation, not congregation, sorry. In the midst of a, a totally evil generation, Noah stands out. He didn't stray from upright living. Verse 9 says, he walked with God. Noah walked with God. I want you to, to struggle with that a little bit. Think about that. In, in a good way, could it even kind of haunt you this week? What exactly does it mean to walk with God? Is one taken up into heaven and, and actually can move from one spot to another with the, the creator of the universe? Does God come down to earth and possess legs and feet and, and move around as we do? What does it mean to, to walk with God? How do we do it? Is it painful? I think of several questions. Is it difficult? What are the benefits? What are the risks? How much does it cost me? On and on those questions go. Noah seems to be a diamond in the midst of counterfeits. He walked with God, and we can too. <coughs> Excuse me. I like what Leroy Lawson says in Up From Chaos. Believe in the God who controls the floods and fires. Trust in the God whose hope is to rescue, not to lose the human race. We should obey the voice of the one who orders an ark to be built, even as the noise of the disbelieving crowds rage in our ears. We should be ready, for we don't know the day or the hour. So folks, what I, what I want us to think about today is, what does it look like to walk with God? And can you and I walk with God if so, let's practice it. Let's do it. Let's get better at it. We've got to choose to walk with Him. We must fellowship with Him, communicate with Him. We follow His instructions. We tell others about Him. It's a deliberate act on our part to walk with God. Nothing more important could be said about you or me at our funerals than he or she walked with God. Here are just a couple of hints from Noah on how to do it. Number one, total devotion to the Lord. Nothing else, nobody else can get in the way of total devotion to the Lord. Here's Psalm 73, 23 through 26. <clears throat> Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Or Isaiah says this in 26.9, My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning my spirit longs for you. When your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. Or the words of Jesus Christ, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Total devotion to God. If we're going to walk with God, we've got to be devoted to Him. He is willing and, and more than we can imagine to, to walk with us. His desire is to be with us and for us to be with Him, but we've got to have that same desire. We must choose to follow Him. Noah was in constant communication with the Lord, not just on ark construction, but on holy living. Think about the Lord. Meditate on the Lord. Talk often with the Lord. Tell others about the Lord. You know what Peter calls Noah? He calls him a preacher of righteousness. 
We don't have any recorded sermons of, of Noah. But Peter calls him a preacher of righteousness. He was proclaiming the news about God. He was warning the people of his day about what was coming. We've got to tell others if we're going to walk with God. Allow devotion to the Lord to permeate every area of your life. No matter where you are or what you're doing, let the Lord be your constant guide. It, it worked with Noah, and it can work with you too. So first thing, just total devotion to the Lord. Number two, would you please, like Noah, go against the flow of humanity? Think again of Noah's time. The earth is totally corrupt, clear to the point that God says, I'm going to wipe them away. I'm sorry that I've, I've made humankind. And Noah was upright. Noah was blameless, in a sense. Noah was walking out with God. He stands out all by himself in the midst of sinful humanity. The temptation for Noah, and especially I think the, the temptation for us, is to go along with the crowd. It's kind of a mob mentality thing, to, to go along with the crowd. Everybody else is doing it. We'll accept it because it's what everybody's doing. Don't go along with the crowd. Go against the crowd when it needs to happen. There seems to be that natural desire within each one of us to sin. I don't like it. I wish it wasn't the case. But it seems like we all want to sin. We don't have to sin, but it seems like we want to. Paul struggles with it. Romans chapter 7, you remember that passage? It says the the good that I want to do, I don't do. The, the thing that I hate, I keep on doing. This internal struggle, constantly going back and forth. He even finally ends that with, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thankfully, he answers his own question later, Jesus Christ. But we struggle. I can think of a couple of hymns, a couple of old hymns that talk about our want, our desire, our bent toward sinning. The hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, there's the phrase, take away our bent to sinning, Alpha and Omega B, end of faith is its beginning, set our hearts at liberty, or come thou found of every blessing, that has the phrase in it, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Do you really want to walk with God? Then he got against the flow. You got to go against the flow. You can do it. Paul lists some examples from Israel's history. What happened when they strayed from God, and then what happened to them in the way of punishment. These things happened to them. This is 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 13. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Go against the flow. Romans 12 says, in one translation, don't be squeezed into the world's mold, but be transformed. Go against the flow. Be not just your own person, but be God's person. That's the way to walk with the Lord. And then there's a third aspect. Walk like Jesus walked. We've got a bit of an advantage over Noah. Noah knew God. He spoke with God as did the patriarchs. God spoke with him. But we have the example of Jesus Christ. That makes all of the difference. You could think of the little bracelet that's been popular for years and years, WWJD. What, what would Jesus do in this situation? Probably could change it even better to WWJD. What, what did Jesus do? WWDJ. What did Jesus do? We've got it in Scripture. Find out how Jesus reacted when he was tempted, when he was lonely, when he was hungry, when he felt alone. What did Jesus do? Follow his example. Walk the way that he did. Listen to just a few verses of Scripture. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him. Or one translation says, walk in Him. Rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. 
That was Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Here's 1 John 2, 6. Whoever claims to live in him, speaking of Jesus, must walk as Jesus did. Or 1 Peter 2, 21. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Charles Sheldon, back in, I think, 1896, wrote the book, What Would Jesus Do?, called In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do?, sold millions of copies, simply asking the question through every situation in life, what would Jesus do? How would he handle this? Here's Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Or this one, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. That's what it means to to walk with God. Or this one, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Just one more, James chapter 4. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You think we can walk with God? Even in 2022, you think it's possible? Yeah, folks, we can And we've got to. There's no other way. Fourth thing, it takes work. Scripture indicates that Noah worked on the ark for about a hundred years. A hundred years. Again, they lived a whole bunch longer back then than we do. But for a hundred years, he is working, cutting down trees, sawing up timber, finding nails, getting the boys to help lift stuff. Perhaps building all kinds of scaffolding. I don't know what else he did, but he worked. In our society today, never have you seen so many help wanted ads. Going toward uh, Johnstown, the the egg farm now has a, a whole host of signs out about all the benefits you can get from working there. They want workers, and yet nobody seems to want to work. Everybody would rather have a, a, a free handout. Take care of me. Give me what I need. Give me what I want. It takes work. Now, now don't, don't get me wrong. Salvation is free. Jesus Christ paid the price. It's the easiest thing in one sense to do, to accept Jesus Christ as Lord. It's the, the only way. But it's His work on the cross that saves us. Nothing that we do in and of ourselves. Salvation is free. Grace is free. But growth takes work. To grow in the Lord, to, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, it takes work, and it's okay this scripture. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. That's 1 Peter chapter 1, 13 through 16. King James Version says, Gird up the loins of your mind. Do you get that passage? Gird up the loins of your mind. Those who wore robes in, in Bible times, if they were going to work or run or do anything, had to, to gird up the, the skirts the, of their robe, tie them into the, the, the belt of their girdle, whatever. Gird up the loins. It's sort of like for us, it's roll up your sleeves. I just preached my stepmother's funeral. We had her for, I think, 37 years, something like that. And I got a kick out of Betty Finner. Betty loved to eat in general, liked good food, but her favorite was dessert. And I actually saw Karen's stepmom, my stepmother-in-law, at a restaurant, eating a great meal, appreciating everything about it, but then it was time for dessert. And Betty actually rolled up her sleeves because it's time to get serious about dessert. And she did. That's kind of what this passage is talking about. Get serious about work. wonder about my little illustration here. Terry's table was tucked away, and I made sure I didn't want to get it greasy, so I put a towel down, so make sure and tell him that I, I didn't get his table greasy. 
I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the old grease gun. This is my family's grease gun. My daddy used this, I used this, my brothers used this to, to grease combines, discs, tractors, everything else. This thing just saved a whole bunch of problems. Uh, bearings were, were to made to last longer because we, we greased them where they were supposed to be greased. Used it faithfully all the time. The thing worked well. But then one day, it kind of froze up. You couldn't move the handle anymore. We didn't know what to do about our grease gun, so finally we decided to, uh, to put a Zerk in it. How many of you know what a Zerk is? I'd like to ask one lady in particular. Sharon Clayton, do you know what a Zerk is? You do not. Oh, this is one. What about your daughter, Darcy? A Zerk is a grease fitting. I was hoping Sharon Clayton would say she knew because Karen says, do not use the word Zerk. Nobody knows what a Zerk is, but a bunch of them did. We finally put a, a Zerk on this grease gun, a grease fitting. I got a little grease. Uh, did you shake my hand yet? No, you better not. Finally put a Zerk on this grease gun, and you know what? If we greased it a couple of times, maybe um, every month or so, it began working again, and it was okay. We could still use it, but then it got worse. We had to grease it weekly, and that was a problem. And, and then it got worse. Finally, this old grease gun, the only way that it will do anything is if it's plugged into itself all of the time. And it works great now, but all it does is kind of circulate the grease. It doesn't take near as much grease as it used to. We don't have to put tubes in very often and, and to, because it's just using its own grease. And it's great because we love this old grease gun. It has such deep meaning. You know, this could be an illustration of the church, of Jesus Christ. It could be an illustration of your life, my life. We come to Christ and we begin doing what we're supposed to do and making disciples. That's the, the work that we're called to do. That's the Great Commission. But then maybe there's some struggles. We sort of freeze up. There's turmoil within the church. We say, hey, we better take care of ourselves. And so we start taking care of ourselves. And then if we're not careful... The church becomes the machine that exists just to help itself out. And we don't reach out into the world. We don't do the work that Christ wants us to do. I hope you'll think of my parable of the grease gun. I'm going to wipe my hands off now. Share one more scripture. And then I want us to, to pause and pray and think about what scripture is telling us. Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Two paths. Which will you choose to follow? It's possible to walk with God. That's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians, as Jesus Christ followers. We walk with Him every day of our lives. He permeates our being. But we've got to choose to do that. A few of you, I noticed the Hewitt family is not here today. I was going to kind of count on them. Bob Banks is here. I'm thankful for that. Wilderness camp for probably 30-some years. Jennifer, you probably remember the song. We would always close Vespers with a song called, I Choose to Follow. If you know it, would you sing it with me? If you don't, it's going to be a solo and I really need Jeff Warner to come sing, but Jeff always says he's not going to sing. Are you ever going to sing with me, Jeff? Ever? Someday, maybe? Jeff always says no. Notice this song. It goes like this. Sing along if you know it. I choose to follow. I choose to let you lead. With childlike faith, I'll walk each day, knowing that you're all I need. I choose to love you. Because you've chosen me of all the things that I could choose to do, I choose to follow you. It's a choice we make. Pray with me, would you? Father, help us to make that choice every day of our lives to walk with you. Help us to realize that, that this world is walking in the wrong direction. Help us to realize that, that this world is doomed for destruction, just like Noah's generation. Lord, I pray that that we might be totally devoted to you. I pray that when need be, we would go against the flow. We pray, Lord, that, that we would tell others about you. We pray, Father, that we might be able to follow the example of your son, Jesus Christ. 
Lord, help us, guide us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Everybody, we don't. We don't always. Excuse me. We don't always know where we are. Uh, we don't always know where each other is in their walk, or how their life is going. 
We see it some. Um, but you know where you are. God knows where you are. We go up and down. Highs and lows. But through it all, God is there. <clears throat> He's always there. He sent his son to pay a price because of who we are. Go forth from this place in peace, knowing that God loves you regardless of where you are, of what you're doing, of what you've done. Because of Jesus Christ, we have a hope that we will be with him. And that's, I don't know what else to say about it. But have a great, great week. Be positive in what we're doing. Be positive with each other. Be positive to those around you. Be uplifted in knowing that uh, God loves you and Christ died for you. Um, have a great week, everybody. Thanks.